Well, the biggest symptom is traffic congestion. That's, that's the one everybody can see right away. But traffic congestion really is more a symptom than it is a, a cause or a problem all by itself. The cause is two pieces. One piece is just tremendous growth. Uh, as the mayor is fond of saying, we have doubled in size every 20 years since the Civil War. Actually, I was the guy who coined that phrase a while back. It's no longer quite true, for which I am grateful. But it's uh, we're still growing more rapidly than almost any other city in the country. I think we, we had we had we were the second highest fastest growing city in the last decade. Um, that's too that's very fast, and it's very difficult to incorporate that kind of the, that number of people. It's extremely difficult to build the kind of roads necessary to be able to provide transportation for those people, and it's very difficult to build infill development that fast. Infill takes a little bit longer. Greenfield developments on the outside of town are really quick and easy. You just buy a plot of land, you plant a bunch of houses, just like the houses you built the last time, and you can have a development up much more quickly. Infill requires negotiations with the neighbors, making sure your zoning is in place, probably hiring an architect to design a building which is different from other buildings because there are special constraints on the site and so on and so on. Well, anyway, what we end up with is a sprawling city like Los Angeles, which one of the symptoms of sprawling cities is you can't build the roads fast enough, and even when you do, the vehicle miles traveled are so great that you just can't get people in and out on, on roads. So I, the best way to solve our traffic problem, I think, turns out to be also to solve our sprawl problem. Right. We've been losing money for years. We, we need to stop losing money. What we've done is started to go through every aspect of the rate case from beginning to end. How much money do we need? How do we use the money we got? How much do we need in reserves? What are our constraints from our fiscal policies and so on? Just layering, you know, one layer of detail over another. Um, we're about halfway through that. I suspect two things. One of them is we've got so many details in our heads that at some point, some of the city council members will run screaming for the room saying, don't tell me anymore. I can't deal with any more of this. But I think second is having steeped ourselves in the minutia of what the rate setters had to do in Austin Energy. We have a better sense for what their constraints are, what they really need to accomplish, and what they try to accomplish that doesn't need to be accomplished. I think we've learned a lot of stuff at to this point, and I think we're almost to the point where we can say, we may not need the next six sessions. We may be able to just go straight to a proposal which actually does make sense, which we can justify, which does raise the rates, but in a fair way, uh, and will not have as big an impact on residential customers in particular as the original proposal. I think we can reduce that more and more electricity you use, the more and more you pay for the next kilowatt hour. I think there's broad spread agreement in Austin Energy and on the council that that's a really good idea. The big users should pay more than the small users, um, and that's going to encourage conservation. In order to pay a lower electric bill, one of the best things to do is become a smaller user than you are, that you won't be paying so much for that last kilowatt hour. So I think we're going to keep the tiered rate structure. We're going to be able to run that fixed rate, that fixed cost, down from 22 bucks to something like 8 eight and a half, that neighborhood. And we're going to dramatically increase the amount of money we spend on the CAP program, the Customer Assistance Program. That's the program we give to people who are on Medicaid, on food stamps. This would just be an extension of that. You don't get free electricity. Nobody gets free electricity. That's, that's bad for conservation. But we could pay your fixed fees and pay uh, some give you offer you some kind of a discount on your electricity for everybody who qualifies for food stamps and Medicare. Okay. Certainly, it's something should be put, put to voters in November. And the question is not whether but what. The critical issue is not 10-1, as we've been hearing, 10-1 versus 10-2-1. Should we have a pure system or a hybrid? I think the real question is single-member districts versus 0-6. We've put this to voters six times before. It's gone down six times in a row. And I don't think there's any point in putting up the seventh proposal if it's doomed to failure. I think what we need to do is figure out, of the proposals available, which one is most likely to pass and put that before the voters. If it's 10-1, that's great. It's nice and simple and easy to understand. It's got a head of steam. A lot of people think they want it. But I know there are a lot of people on the West Side. There's a lot of Asian Americans. There's people all over the city who will support a hybrid who will not support a pure single-member district system. And what we've got to balance is the head of steam and the enthusiasm of the 10-1 supporters, which is going to help that proposal, versus the additional 
votes or the additional acquiescence you can get from some people who would be willing to support a hybrid but wouldn't support a pure proposal. And one last thing I should say about that. If the 10-1 supporters succeed in getting the signatures and getting 10-1 on the ballot, it would be very difficult for me to put any kind of a competing proposal on the ballot because one thing I do know is if there are two proposals on the ballot, they're going to split the vote, and it's less likely that either of them would pass. I think we need one proposal. First thing to remember about affordability is there's two pieces to where you live. One of them is what your rent or your mortgage looks like. The other one is what does your journey to work look like? You can buy a house for a whole lot less money in Maynard than you can in Crestview, but if you're in Maynard, you got a 20-mile commute to work, and at about 50 cents a mile, that's what the IRS will give you for, for mileage. We're talking about $20 a day to get to work. That's a $20 per working day that more or less is layered on top of your mortgage, much higher than if you were commuting from Crestview or Hyde Park. If people were to think about it in that way, what's the total cost of living here versus there, then uh, infill developments make a whole heck of a lot more sense. We can build uh, houses, townhomes, condos at a reasonable rate. They're still going to be a little bit more expensive than a single-family house in Maynard. But the benefit is you don't have a 20-mile commute to get into work or not. You also don't have to spend as much time on the road in order to get to work. So time is time is money for most of us. Most of us would prefer not to have to spend 45 minutes or an hour just to get to work in the morning. We've started to work on that, and that's, that's part of the the idea behind Imagine Austin, the, the, the comprehensive plan, is to get people's arms around the idea that this is a good general direction for us to go in. When you ask people generally, is infill a good idea? Do you want a compact city? Almost everybody says, yes, this is a good idea. It's going to be cheaper. We don't like sprawl. I want to be able to get out of the country by driving 20 minutes out in any road in any direction. All of a sudden, I'm out in, in pasture land and fields. This is great. But then you ask them, okay, what's going to have to happen in order to produce that, given we got a million people coming to town in the next 20 years, is some changes in your neighborhood. Things get really dicey because nobody wants density in their neighborhood. Okay, well, what we have to do is unpack that term. Density could mean townhouses that look like this. It could mean apartment buildings that look like that. What exactly the constraints are from a neighborhood's point of view as to what they can accept and what they can't is going to differ from one neighborhood to the next. And we actually need to have a conversation as to what, how tall it can be, how dense it can be, how many people can live there, what it looks like from the outside. And the, probably the results are going to be a little bit different from one neighbor to the next. If we don't have the conversation, we're just going to get a flat no. If we have the conversation, I think we're going to get a lot of yeses because people want, want not to sprawl and they don't want to pay the cost of sprawl. But they still need a little bit of extra help figuring out, well, what's actually going to work with my neighborhood? We needed a train system which was not going to cost too much, which would be used or could be used by pretty much anybody in the in the area. Everybody needed to look at that train system and say, I could get on that. I may not get on it every day. It may not be my primary means of commuting to work, but I can see that there is going to be a time when I'm going to be able to use that. Um, right now, we don't have an urban rail proposal that looks that way, that I think anybody in South Austin or Northwest Austin would look at and say, I can imagine getting on that train. And until we do, when we go to a public vote, a lot of people are going to vote it down because they're not going to see themselves on it. They're not going to see it's going to be of value to them. Uh, what's going to be of value to them is a, a regional system, which is going to connect people all over the area. And a system, in the sense it's not just the red line does one thing, the Lone Star Rail does a completely different thing, and then we've got this urban rail, which sort of connects the two. We need something which actually behaves like a system, where you've got schedules that make sense, where they... they you can get from one place, even if you have to take a couple of trains to get there, you can get to pretty much any place else in the city using that train. And we're not there yet. Well, certainly the rapid bus is, is going to be faster and cheaper. Uh, it's not going to be as effective as, as running a train, but it's something we can get up right away. Friend, my friend Steve Bayer used to run Capital Metro years ago, was explaining to me that there's a developmental sequence. You can start with buses, just stop at red lights, usual buses. The next step above that could be a rapid bus where you've got buses which have, have some control over the lights, like we're talking about with the bus rapid transit system. The next step would be buses in their own guideway where it would just be buses. No, you couldn't get cars on them. And the next step beyond that would be to put a train in the same place. And he says it's so much cheaper to run a rapid bus than it is to lay down 
train tracks. And you also get the benefit of finding out what happens when you run that rapid bus. If we actually run this thing with 10-minute headwise, are people going to get on it? And if they get on it, yeah, we've learned something valuable. We run it for two or three years. We realize the route's going to prove out. Then we can lay some tracks down, and it'll be a little bit cheaper and a little bit faster uh, for people who are taking it after we lay the tracks down. So I'm not sold that that's the best way to do it. There's a reasons for going straight to rail as well, but that's an interesting idea, which we've really given very little thought to. We've got serious unanswered questions about the train right now. What's it going to cost to construct? What's it going to cost to operate? Who's going to operate it? Where is it going to go? And until we answer those questions, I think it's way premature to go before the voters with, with just the idea of railness, which is kind of what we got right now. We know rail is going to help us at some point, but we haven't worked out all the details. We need to work out the details.